Welcome to Minds of Mountain Film. I'm Josh Bernstein, and my guest today is conservationist Mike Fay, who really needs no introduction, Mike. You're an old friend of Mountain Film. You are a world-renowned conservationist, long-distance hiker, National Geographic explorer in residence, Wildlife Conservation Society, longtime supporter, and now running the parks in Gabon. Uh, where should we start? I mean, what is, it seems like I could have endless questions for you. Let, Let's wait. not start at the beginning. <laughs> okay. Okay. Fair, fair enough. But uh, if we could, let's go, let's go through the mega transit first, because I think that is what, what most people came to associate with you. Yeah. Uh, what, what is it like undertaking that type of ordeal, and how did, it, how did the idea start? Well, I, I first kind of um, discovered that that kind of path through the forest by flying over the forest of Central Africa r extensively for about five years. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, for all of that time, those five years, I would fly probably three or four times a week and I would just explore new little river valleys and mountaintops and little blocks of forest here and there. And I could also see the, the human kind of landscape advancing into those huge forests and and it was just very clear in my mind because I knew the landscape so well exactly where this swath of forest that was still virgin was but that that humans would be there in in a matter of a year or two or three mm -hmm. and so you know I thought there was this great urgency to to really show that we were going to lose that last um, kind of line of, of really virgin wild forest left in all of Central Africa. So while you were doing these initial flyovers, were you taking notes? Were you, were you aware that you had to start documenting what was disappearing, what was going to be happening? Well, soon? I was actually um, running a park in northern um, Congo mm -hmm. that we had created back in 1991. And I worked there for about 10 years. But because I had an airplane, um, all the other parks in the whole region would ask me to kind of come in and do surveys and we did a lot of aerial um, kind of uh, techniques that had never been done before. I think we were probably the first guys to develop a, a GPS tracked video kind of um, apparatus where we could, we could basically look on the map as we flew when we would visualize our video so we could really go back and look at, at everything that we saw and, and document it. So um, we got around. Sure. At what point did you decide to go from, uh, I guess, a more casual uh, uh, relationship with flying over things to the more formal mega transect, let's actually do the whole crisscrossing pattern? Well, in 1997, um, we had a big war in Congo. And so we changed our base from, from uh, Brazzaville to Libreville in Gabon. And I would go to Gabon quite a bit. But also things got very kind of, um, I would just say that the war changed me mm -hmm. in a very fundamental way. And, and the way it changed me was that I realized that, that humans can just basically do anything they want whenever they want to do it. You know, you don't have to stay within the confines of, of you know, what you think is kind of normal because um, taking a transect like that is not something that most people kind of think of and um, especially you know 10 years ago that wasn't that wasn't something that people really undertook um, especially in 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 Central African forest. Mm -hmm. I also got really good at walking in the forest because right. I spent a hell of a lot of time um, taking these long treks but never um, a year and a half or two year long trek maybe a month and a half or two months but I I had all the organizational skills to do it and so I, I thought well you know I've been living this crazy life with this war for the last two years yeah and and I've done things that I never thought I would do so I'm just gonna take a big long walk you know and, and I'd always wanted to do that in my life so I thought it'd be a great way to kind of just um, really get the data that we needed to start to put together a big park system. Re regarding the big long walk, because you seem to be, you've made a specialty out of it. <laughs> is there anything, just curious, for people who don't know you as well, was there parts of your childhood? Was there parts of, not to overanalyze, but, but you grew up in New Jersey, you went to University of Arizona. At what point would your mom say, oh yeah, that's my boy, he loves to hike? Yeah, well I, I actually, um, my, my first 12 years were in California. Okay. in the foothills of um, kind of the L.A. basin there. And I basically had 
two choices as I was growing up. Um, to walk up the hill into kind of wilderness mm -hmm. or to walk down into the cityscape. We were basically right at the interface. And so I spent most of my time as a kid up in the woods, yeah. um, either with you know my brother or a few of his friends or just by myself. And I've always been kind of a uh, loner and I've always loved walking in the woods. So, yeah. um, you know, when I think of something to do, that's all I usually ever think of to do is just take a walk. What's a typical day like when you're hiking 2,000 miles? How do you break up? I know that there's a, one of the, one of the speakers here in one of the films of Mountain Film was saying that the African expression, how do you eat an elephant? Uh, the answer is one bite at a time. Yeah. When you're undertaking these, these almost uh, elephant-like 2,000 mile hikes, how do you approach that? What is, the, what is the trick to getting through each day's hike? Well, I think, you know, if you're, if you're good at what you do and you're organized mm -hmm. so that you're not completely starving to death or you're not dealing with health problems that you can't overcome, um, getting day-to-day -day is, is um, you know, kind of uh, surprisingly um, kind of demanding. I would say, you know, you think, oh, well, you just get up in the morning, you start walking, you, you know, kind of camp out in the evening, and mm -hmm. that's it, you know. But, but actually, you know, you, I had 12 guys walking with me, and and they're African guys that have never had really good health care in their lives, and so just about every day when you wake up, there's a health problem you have to deal with, right. and you don't have. Um, you know, a surgery there, you don't have a doctor, you don't mm -hmm. have, it's just you, you know, and you're the coach, you're the doctor, you're the mother, you're the father, you're the priest, you're, mm -hmm. you're everybody, yeah. you know, and so, you know, you get up and, and you're going to leave with your, um, your point man an hour and a half or two hours before everyone else, so, so you have to be up at the crack of dawn. And then you have to deal with a couple of health problems, and then you have to figure out why this guy's not happy, and why this guy wants to go home, and why mm -hmm. this, and why that, and how we're going to organize our meals, etc. And then you take off, and you walk all day, um, bushwhacking, and you have to figure out how to get where you want to go. And it's not easy. It's never easy in the forest in Africa. There's always um, dense vegetation or rivers to cross or mountains to go up or um, some kind of just swamp or, or obstacle that you need to get across. But then at the same time, you're collecting data all day, every day. So every single step of the way, you're writing things down and, mm -hmm. you're, and you're visualizing in your brain kind of the progression of... of what's happening in that forest as as you get deeper and deeper you know how how does the wildlife and the and the forest react to um, less and less human presence you know and so your mind is also working all day every day yeah and then you get to camp and you've got to figure out where you're going to sleep and what water you're going to drink and how you're going to cook your food and and figuring out how much food you have and then solving another two or three health problems mm -hmm. and then hanging out with the dudes for an hour or a half so writing up your notes, and then finally getting to bed by 10. And this went on for how many months? This went on for, for years? Uh, uh, 18 months. 18 months, starting in 1997. Starting right. actually in 1999. Oh, okay. Ending in 2000. The, arguably the greatest explorer, Serrano Fines, at least the greatest living explorer, was asked about his expeditions to the Arctic and what it was that gave him the ability to, to push through and succeed. And he said, I've got a guy on my team who could basically create a hot shower for me anywhere. That was his one source of renewal. Is there anything that you, having spent you know, years and thousands of miles on the trail, that you look for in a day or in a week to say, okay, I've got this, I'm fine? I think that you have to have this complete knowledge that um, no matter what happens, unless you're kind of dead or completely incapacitated, um, you'll, you'll find a solution. You know, you don't, you don't worry. You mm -hmm. don't get scared. You don't, you don't doubt yourself. You don't, you don't look backward. You only look forward. And, and once you get in that mindset, um, you know, you, you, you can face unbelievable kind of pressure and hardship and not really think about it. But I also think long walks are... Um, very interesting from that point of view because you know when you've been walking for for three months or four months 
and that's all you do all day, every day. Yeah. And, and there's nothing coming in from the outside. There's no distraction. You're completely in your own little world. Then you, th then it, that world completely absorbs you. And so you don't really think about anything else. Right. And, and so, you know, turning back is not even a thought in your brain. You're, you're having so much fun kind of on this voyage of discovery that, that you know, you can be um, half your body weight and you're not going to think about it. You're not going to be hungry. You know, you're, sure. you're not going to be worried about, you know, anything that's coming in from the outside. So I think it's, it's, it's long walks get you into a mindset that you can't get to any other way. But is there not one thing that you'd be like, I just need a chocolate bar after six weeks, or I just, you know, I need my, is there one item that's been your friend throughout all these journeys <laughs> in Africa and in California? Uh, not not your necessarily tacos? something. I, mean, anything, you know, yeah. um, I would say my tent. Okay. Which yeah. you're actually camping in here at Mountainville. Yeah. That's, that's your tent right behind me? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. So here you have the opportunity in Telluride to sleep in a hotel, and yet you decided, well, I'm, this is my old friend and I'm going to sleep in my tent? Well, I just, you know, I, I get into this kind of, um, again, mindset where, where, you know, you set up your tent at night and you've yeah. got your little setup there and um, everything is organized and it is familiar. Yeah. So you can go wherever you want to go. And if you're in that tent that evening, um, you're basically home. You yeah. Know? And, and so uh, for me, that that's something that is um, essential wherever I go. Yeah. Even mountain film. Sure. You know, it, I'm I'm gonna be um, there with my uh, with okay. my tent. But okay. you know I, I I don't know. I think it's more about this. Sure. I, and I can tell that this you've got worked out pretty well. <laughs> I mean you're you're very tenacious and determined. When you go back to Gabon and you I know now you're running the parks there. I'm curious just quickly. Do you sleep in your tent in Gabon or do you have a home? I do. Okay. No, so I'm, this is home. I Everywhere. have a, uh, a tent set up in the back of the office, okay. and I just okay. sleep back there. But I travel around the country a lot, mm -hmm. so um, again, yeah, my tent's always there, and okay. I'm always comfortable. And you're now running the, is it 13 parks that were created as a result of your mega transect? Yeah, we, we created those parks in 2002. Mm -hmm. um, President Omar Bongo um, just decided, based on, on what we were showing him as far as um, what was in his country and the urgency um, of what we were dealing with because of logging coming into virtually every single forest in his country. He just decided overnight we're going to do this and he did it. Mm -hmm. And then people think, well, you know, are they really going to enforce these parks? Are they real? Are they, are they kind of um, anything other than a publicity stunt, you know? Um, if you go back there 10 years later, which I've done, and you see that, that um, in fact, there is no logging in these parks at all, and there were they were covered with logging concessions when we made those parks. It mm. wasn't like nothing was there. It was they were already covered with actual blocks that had been designated, but they got taken off the off the map. You know, mm -hmm. but but the logging hadn't arrived yet. But it was on the verge of happening. So you think, my God, that's that's amazing because now in Gabon and and in, on that entire transect line that I walked. The only virgin forest left is where there are parks today. Wow. That's how quickly it happened. Yeah. And, and the writing was on the wall. And so the fact that we got it done was one, miraculous, and two, essential to have any virgin forest left in, in any of these countries. Yeah. Because that will be the only virgin forest left in Central Africa in 10 years from now. Stuff that's in for this forest that's in parks. So, you know, you. You, you kind of get called by the president and he says, I want you to run the parks, mm -hmm. um, you can't refuse. Sure. You know, I, I was happy um, hanging out in Alaska, exploring uh, the northern reaches of um, kind of the North American rainforest, which I have also fallen in love with in the last mm -hmm. few years. Um, but, you know, you, you, you have few opportunities um, in your lifetime to have enough authority, enough power to be able to really make substantial things happen very quickly. Yeah. And, and the other thing that I'm realizing with this job in Gabon is just how important um, power and leadership is. You know, yeah. and, and, and you think it's like, you know, if, if the world leaders 
um, just put as much energy as we are into Gabon parks in, in one country, into the world's kind of uh, cataclysmic crisis that we face ecologically on this planet, we could solve this problem sure. um, in a couple of years, you know, and yet, and yet, I don't know of a single leader in this world other than the president of Gabon that is acting um, proactively and, and really trying to conceptualize how he is going to keep at least his country um, sustainably managed for the next several generations, you know, and that's a pretty substantial thing. You mentioned that the writing was on the wall in Central Africa and that you have a tendency, as, as I do, to fall in love with natural environments everywhere. Uh, the writing on the wall across the planet seems to be pretty dire, as we've been discussing here at Mountain Film. What would be, and I realize that you're only empowered, in, but impressively, in one country, what would you, if you were empowered to make changes across the world, you mentioned in your talk yesterday morning about tithing and how people need to be coaxed to give resources to protect the planet. What, what would be your approach? Well, if I was um, the the president of every single country on Earth, right. you know, tomorrow, okay. all of a sudden, boom, I'm yep. the president of every country. So I rule the world. I would very quickly um, uh, mount an emergency program that would make um, Obama's economic kind of bailout um, uh, kind of worthwhile. Mm -hmm. And it would be um, probably two or three times the, the kind of magnitude of what, of what he did, which from my point of view is not that much um, money. And, you, sure. and when you look at how quickly and how easily um, the U.S. government and the world was able to muster a few trillion dollars, it's like, why can't we do that for the planet? It, it just doesn't make any sense to me that yeah that we've got like Copenhagen going on and there is zero result from Copenhagen. Right. And that the industrial complex of the planet seems to co-opt everything anyone ever tries to do for conservation. So so I would I would make sure that that we put in the laws that we need to make sure and to force um, everyone who uses resources to be mindful of how they impact ecosystems and to make sure that that resource base maintains its maximum productivity. And if you did th that simple kind of process worldwide tomorrow, mm -hmm. as well as keeping, you know, um, protected areas protected and, and keeping those intact forests intact and keeping species around and keeping creeks um, kind of flowing with pure water and keeping fish in those waters mm -hmm. and keeping the oceans full of fish. and all those things we could do, we right. could do them, and and it would just be kind of every president deciding this is a national priority. It's a it's a it's a crisis that we face, and we're going to address it tomorrow. Right. So the, I guess the trick, the challenge, the goals of places like Mount Film is to get the word out and convince people so that there's the political will to make that happen. And I guess un, until that happens, we'll have to keep keep on our soapboxes and helping spread the word. And I want to say. Thanks for being a mountain film. Thanks. And thanks it's a pleasure to watch you work, and I look forward to, <laughs> to hearing where you go next. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Yeah, catch you later.